So far we have looked at a number of different representations of numbers and the reason for that is because numbers are sort of the primary use case of a computer, right? Computers were originally designed for the purpose of computation, which means arithmetic manipulation, which means that numbers need to be represented inside them. However, computers also process text. It could be as simple as just being able to read the program that you are trying to convey into it. But there are a number of other scenarios. For example, nowadays, of course, you know, we all take it for granted that you have web browsers and so on. But even at a time before that, at the very least, people were using computers for handling things like payroll applications where a list of employees in a company would need to be stored somewhere. And that list would essentially consist of the names of the employees, which means that we are now talking about text in English or some other language like that. Now, what we can do is that we can take text right, and also encode that into binary because after all these are also symbols. An example would be that we could just say that all the letters in the alphabet A, B, C up to Z and the digits 0, 1 up to 9, we will take all of them and treat them as symbols that need to get encoded. So far there are only around 36 characters, so that is good. Uh, no, a few more characters because I might also want to represent lowercase letters, right? The small a, small b, and so on. This is sort of a peculiar artifact of the English or rather the Latin script, but it turned out to be important enough that people decided, okay, let's you know, try and accommodate those. But then there are a few more, right? I mean, you also need to have punctuation, extra marks for indicating uh, the kind of operations you are doing, and so on. But even if you add all of that together, you end up with somewhere between like a 100 to 200 such characters, right? If you can be fairly generous and say, okay, you know, uh, it would still land up considerably less than 200. What does that mean? 2 power 8 is 256, which means that 8 bits should be pretty much okay to represent everything that we have out here, right? And that in fact was what was used for the longest time, right? Uh, there is in fact a stand. So, what we need over here is we need some kind of an encoding which basically says that I will take each of these characters and map them to a number and the other way around. I'll, if I have a number, I know that it represents this character. If I have this character, I know that it, the computer can represent it as this number. Right? So, it is a sort of uh, mapping between the two. Right? That is called a character encoding. Right? And this character encoding, one of the most popular for a long time was what was called ASCII. And it's still, the term is still used, right? It stands for the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. Now, interestingly, ASCII actually started out as a 7-bit code, not 8 bits, because they did not really want to represent a lot of special characters out there. And 7 bits is actually sufficient for, you know, just the alphabets, digits, and the few extra symbols that you want. But somewhere along the way, especially once computers themselves started moving towards 8-bit values and so on, people decided to just shift it to an 8-bit ASCII and added some extra special characters that could be represented. ASCII was by no means the only encoding. There were a whole lot of them. It was probably the most popular one, the most successful one in some sense. Right? That is the main reason to remember it. But what about other languages, Hindi? Russian, Chinese, right? Each of them has their own sort of script, right? In Hindi, in fact, the kind of things that we would notice in Hindi is it's not just the letter ha that we have, we also have the matras that we need to represent. And they actually need to get combined with the letter and this is, you know, the half and so on, right? There are a number of sort of intricacies that happen when you actually try representing a new language. What about Russian? It basically has a completely different set of characters and Chinese or the Chinese and the related languages are much more complex because they use ideograms, pictographs that can number in several thousands right, to even be meaningful. So, how do you deal with something like this? Can you actually assign a unique code for each letter, right? So, for example, does the letter ha get one number for the coding? What about he? Is that treated as one specific num, uh, you know, alphabet and therefore it gets a code or do you have like two different characters combined together in order to give he? Right? What about D? 
is that three different characters or is it one special character on its own right so clearly there were complications the moment we started looking at other languages other than just the romanized uh, you know the roman alphabet and uh, the languages related to that and along the way right unicode has essentially emerged it's not emerged recently it's been around for a while as one consistent encoding and representation so effectively what it says is that it will handle all of this right so there have been solutions proposed for how we are supposed to handle each and every one of these scenarios and what it, the approach that it takes is that all of these different alphabets or characters or whatever are represented by something called code points okay? and unicode essentially specifies the code points what you need in addition to that is how does a code point actually get converted into an encoding and the encoding is actually the set of numbers that tells you okay this is the character that's being represented right so once again right i am not going to go into the details of how unicode works or how character encodings are implemented out here right what do you as a programmer need to know the first question is why do i even care and the answer to that is when you are presented with a stream of bits somewhere in the memory of a computer you need to know how to interpret it right we already discussed some conventions that are used if i know that these bits correspond to numbers then i need to know how many bit numbers i need to know if it's two's complement i need to know if it's floating point but given that much information i can actually interpret it as a set of numbers but what if someone told me that these bits actually correspond to text it's a document right maybe it's the constitution of india that has been encoded into uh, for storage right how do i read it right at that point we the uh, you no know, the sort of normal approach from long ago was to assume that it was basically 8 bits per character in fact we sort of implicitly assumed the ascii code was being used which meant that i could just read out 8 bits at a time and go with that and say that you know i will interpret this entire thing as a set of 8 bit characters which in turn corresponds to some text right the implication of this was in the language itself in the programming language right where for example the character data type in a language like c actually refers to 8 bit values but nowadays a character is something else it could potentially be one 8 bit character or it could be something even more than that right in particular when we start using unicode we need an encoding which basically takes those code points defined by unicode and converts them into a set of bits and the most sort of common and popular one among those encodings nowadays is what is called utf8 right now utf8 has one very nice feature which is that it is more or less compatible with ascii meaning that if i actually have text that is in ascii a set of 8 bit values utf8 will also just use 8 bit values in order to store them but it also has the great advantage that if i have some other language hindi chinese vietnamese or any other language with a different script of its own a different fonts and so on it will still be able to represent them right but it will probably take more bits it might take 16 bits in order to represent one character or 24 bits or potentially even up to 32 bits for a single character right most characters can be represented in what is called the basic multilingual plane of uh, unicode which means that it, most of them should fit within 16 bits some might require 24 bits right the problem of course with something like that is even if i tell you that this particular text is in utf8 yes that you know tells you how to interpret it but all it has done is added some extra complexity for you meaning that you now need to be very careful about how you handle the text each byte that you read each 8 bit value that you read might have a different meaning depending on what its value is is it actually a character or is it a prefix corresponding to the next character all of that needs to be interpreted carefully what that means is that in general you know again as a programmer you probably don't need to go around implementing utf8 processing but 
using standard libraries, using standard conventions, in particular making sure that the documents you write are in UTF-8. Those are important so that you can actually share them from one to another. Okay. So let's sort of summarize all our discussion of data representation up to this point, right? The main thing is that computers store and process bits and nothing but bits, zeros and ones, okay? Memory is an array of bits, the registers inside a CPU are groups of bits okay? and everything that we have been discussing so far revolves around how do we sort of use those bits in a meaningful manner. And the solution that we have come up with boils down to this uh, approach which we can call interpretation through convention. What I mean by interpretation is the bits at the end of the day inside the memory of a computer are just that, they are a set of bits. Do they have any meaning? Are they numbers? Are they characters? Is this a poem? Is it a, a textbook? Is it a math problem? Is it a program? All of that depends on convention. It depends on some context and prior conventions that we have decided to follow, which tell us that probably in this part of the memory, right, or prefixed by certain other uh, data, this corresponds to a program or a piece of text or something else, right? So the convention basically tells us where to look for what, and the interpretation is done based on that convention which tells us that okay if this corresponded to a program then this is how I should actually interpret the different parts of uh, the different bytes that I see out here. The integers of course are the primary things that were required in order to represent any kind of data because they are at the core of what a computer does, right? They revolve around that whole idea of computation. But then what we saw was there were other things that we might want to represent inside a computer. In particular, there are floating point numbers that we will be using as floats and doubles and so on inside a program. There are characters which essentially represent all the text or any interaction that we have with the computer. And later on, as we will see, there will be more complex data collections, data types, data structures that can be implemented, right? And at the end of the day, the main thing that we need to keep in mind over here boils down to this phrase, interpretation through convention. Pretty much all of programming is about how to organize your data and how to apply the right conventions so that someone else reading the program or the computer interprets it properly and does the work that is expected from it.